would probably be the way that people look at someone and they judge them and they judge them on the outside and they don't necessarily take the time to get to know that person. I reckon in the future I see myself as being, I reckon I'll be successful. People aren't building up people but um, kind of cutting them down. Um, my parents are together, they do have the occasional fight, oftentimes they have money and that shows that mm, they think that money can make them happy but you've just got to take the most of what you have and um, yeah, pretty happy home. It seems to be um, that society is demanding quite a lot of um, parents, people in general to um, give a lot of time to their jobs. You know, I mean, I know what that's like, just as a teacher, how many hours I can put in in a week. Um, um, and my husband as well, and the hours that he puts in with his job and it can sometimes be a seven day week for him. As you would know, if you're in that situation, if you don't do those things, then your chances of survival are threatened. Okay. The way they so see themselves, the value they put on themselves, um, often the comes from the value that they feel at home. Dear Alex, this is yet another letter to my own self-contempt. I've definitely gotten smaller. I keep staring at my little hands, wondering how they've gotten me this far. And this doesn't suit me. I'm wearing pink for crying out loud and trying to figure out why it is exactly I don't really want to get out of bed for the rest of my life. How thin girls manage to pay the rent, choose the right job, keep the wrong boy and smile. They're always smiling and I'm missing too much. The city makes me miss far too much. And people are so silly, leaving their self-esteems at home each day. Can someone please remind me to never get involved again with someone who wasn't raised by my mum and dad? <laughs> I think when I was about 13, I used the term poet for the first time, but I still think that's really pretentious. So, yeah. What's in place in the culture, in kids' schools and in community spaces that enable young people to feel like um, participatory members of a democracy? Um, I certainly worry that, that the kind of commercialism and corporate greed that's right now the dominant discourse, it's the ethos and culture, um, interrupts or renders trivial young people's sense of being engaged in a project that's about something bigger than self? I don't know, I think some things might hold some people back from being successful, successful if like their, like their parents or no one gives them enough praise. But what makes me feel vulnerable is um, how God um, actually is inside me. So it's always judging on appearances and it's how you appear, not how the person actually is. Because I'm just starting out, I just shouldn't take things for granted because I still have a lot of my life left and uh, being young has its advantages and it has its disadvantages. When I see models in magazines, uh, on posters, in shopping centres, um, I feel that the pressure is on, that you know, we're meant to all look like that, we're meant to all be beautiful and perfect. Comments from friends when they're like, oh yeah that's really good or like if I get a really good mark they're like yeah well done. And it's all about having the right um, having the right gear and um, having the right clothes and looking good and just um, the pressures of it all. I want you to decide as a team what your ranking would be. I'd say the most challenging force that, that works, that, that, that students and children are dealing with now in terms of building their identity and um, building an idea of who they are is a, a sense that they have to conform and that's, that's something that, that's very challenging that, that children are being encouraged perhaps into one way of thinking or encouraged to, to fit in um, and in order to fit in they have to do certain things or be a certain person or wear certain clothes or have certain material well, possessions. Yeah, feeling good about yourself and having confidence and just not being depressed. 
they will get more out of life and get further okay. on in life if they can be an original person and they can be themselves, they could not always copying everything else. The media is solely responsible for young people's sort of preoccupation with fame. And growing up in Newcastle that was a bit of a big deal when I turned 17. I came to the harsh realisation that I was officially too old to be a childhood prodigy. I really hadn't had my heart set on on that. <laughs> and with Silverchair that you know they had they were famous and making all this money and, and doing great wonderful things when they were 14 and I was about 12 at the time and that's when it just started to kick into gear. I was like, wow, whoa, I've got two years to get it together. That's gonna be hard. And I used to sort of sit down and sort of strategically think about how I could obtain my goals. And I never really got anything done. I just wrote a lot of lists. You just get caught up in it and you, you start to just become obsessed with it and it's not good, who cares? Eat your own stuff, wear your own clothes, you don't, I don't think you need to be spending that much time with your head in a magazine. They're really bad writers too, most of the, well don't quote me on that, but most of the journos aren't, aren't that good. It's bubblegum um, journalism, I think. Mm. There's an enormous amount of distraction in, you know, modern life. It's not at all postmodern. You know, there's a lot of people work, um, and this goes back to the economic questions that um, for many people it's necessary to work longer hours to have both parents working, to have um, even more than one job, and so people are stressed. And then there's the kind of consumption, hyper-consumption that we've all gotten ourselves into, where people want more and they want it now, and so they do the things they have to do to get them, and so that's, um, you know, then, then you have all the things and they're in themselves distracting. If there's always a danger of sort of romanticizing you know, this simple life in Sudan. It wasn't simple at all, but the children didn't have a whole lot of stuff. And they had enormously rich, imaginative, creative um, social lives. And, you know, you, uh, you could see kids here that have a room of toys and don't know what to do. Yeah, the people who don't have as much money, I do feel kind of sorry for them because it's a lot harder to keep up with the fashion in the magazines and I don't know how they feel and sometimes, yeah, I do feel sorry for them and wish that I could kind of help them out even though I don't know how, but yeah. What makes me feel good when, as, as a person is just playing around, playing with my friends, talking to them, um, like just letting out what I think needs to get let out, like the, if I have a problem at home. I know some people in life that, in my life, that don't feel too good about themselves and I think that's because in life you really have to feel accepted and they don't feel accepted because they don't, some people don't treat them as well as they could and make them feel not as important. I feel I'm important because I'm my own individual self, there's no one else like me. There's a lot of public dollars that used to be spent on education now spent on building prisons. In, in, in this country, white youth seem to use drugs at five times the rates of black youth, and yet black youth are imprisoned for drugs at 13 times the rate of white youth. So there's this kind of bifurcation around um, public dollars and private dollars, and one consequence is the very heavy surveillance of police, educators, standardized testing on youth. So the, there are segments of the of, of youth by race and class who, who are being raised in a culture to learn that they're actually not, that there's kind of a discourse of disposability about them. That insofar as yesterday's clothing are disposable, so too are poor kids. Um, 
So, so with greed has kind of emerged this, some bodies are worth taking care of and educating, and some bodies aren't. And I do feel that there, there is a lot of importance that needs to be given to, to building a, a child's confidence in themselves, um, so that they don't feel they have to sort of rely on having things. They don't have to use that as a crutch to get them through life, and if they don't have something, that, that doesn't really, you know, cause them a lot of problems. Head, are you feeling this ice cold Arctic weather? No. <laughs> Nowadays, that it's all about me, 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 and the importance of me um, and my success and uh, my import, my development. I think the the importance of being a part of a team and developing an understanding of each other as a team. Not that you're all the same, but you all have different gifts, different qualities to give. And as you've probably seen today, it's something I'm always trying to build, the idea of teamwork and the fact that everyone's got something different to give. OK. You put a shovel, OK. Why do you think that's important? More people should drive with their car radios off. Um, I think one thing that that young people do, we do far too much of, is we surround ourselves with lots and lots of noise all the time. There's always stuff going on. Always, everyone's got a mobile phone. There's always something to do. No one ever really just turns everything off and just does their own thing. Um, for my birthday, my dad um, hired me this beach house on the coast and he, he said, you know, this is, this is your present and, and the key is you stay there for a week by yourself. I went, yep, yeah, cool. Wow. <laughs> no one calls, no, there's nothing to do. You're just sort of in your own headspace, going for walks, um, that sort of thing. I think it's important for like refueling and it's a spiritual thing as well, listening to your body, putting good things into your body. I'm turning the volume down. <laughs> Having said that, I love driving on the beach with my radio on. It's fun. You know, people have got to see that we who are wealthy don't need more. At this point, we really can, um, can afford to have much greater uh, social equity social justice and um, a sense of empowerment that's shared and and I do think a lot of young people are are concerned about these things I think Seattle and Prague and um, a couple of other instances have been hopeful signs but I, I think it's going to take more organizing I love money and I like to have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of money and I do. With my sister, it's okay, but with my brother, he gets pretty annoying sometimes. And, um, yeah, I have to look after them with my mum my mom and dad at work. What makes my friends uh, more vulnerable or, like, just unhappy is when they're getting left out of, a, like, a little group that's just talking and everything, and they say, oh, we don't like you anymore, uh, go away, uh, or when um, they're getting teased. Money can um, make people feel like they've got everything, but oftentimes it's friends that make you feel like you're valuable. It's encouraging to think that the next generation is not going to just sort of step into the, you know, into the corporate greed that, that we've known for such a long time now. That sense that first only money matters and that the people who make that money and get away with, in some cases, murder, you know, um, f because they're famous and they're stars, can only make a kind of image for, for young people that, that c conveys a message. I don't think kids are any more uh, naive or simple-minded than adults, but there's plenty of naive and simple-minded adults, <laughs> you know, who are, seem to have fallen for all of this. I mean, we, we can't manage to pay public school teachers in New York City a, a decent um, salary, and we have an endless amounts of money for our sports people. <laughs> Thank
Australia and the United States are engaged in the same um, kind of pathological searching for standards that mostly exclude rather than include. Um, so there are a bunch of high schools in New York City where I've just been doing some work where the typical ninth grade class we have K through 12, right? And the typical ninth grade class has between 1,200 and 800 youth. And then the senior class, 12th grade, has between 67 and 250. So those are bodies that are vacating or being tossed out. In an economy that's not actually very suitable to dropouts, we've got a fabulous economy for well-educated people, a terrible economy for poorly educated people. I think in the, mo the biggest impact on self-esteem in children is a feeling of not being needed, um, a feeling of, of not being valued. Um, that, as you said, could come from um, being neglected at home or being left to their own devices or parents perhaps having less time or inclination to interact with children, less time to give them, you know, sit them in front of the television or the PlayStation and let them get on with it that sort of ethos is becoming more common and I think that that gives them less interaction with their parents, less feeling of value. Um, I, 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 mean, no, I know that the demands on parents nowadays is, is very strong with work and time that they have, um, but I still think it's, it's a negative impact on their self, children's self-esteem if they do not feel that they have an important place at home. My experience in schools is kids want to attach a ton. They're barnacles. That kind of tough separation thing melts in a minute. I mean, they, you know, don't give them your home phone number because they're in your life. So, so it's interesting. We create these big high schools that are filled with alienation. And then you create smaller schools and these kids are there late and hanging out and willing to show you crappy drafts of stuff. and. There's a yearning to be vulnerable in a safe space. There is not a yearning to be vulnerable in an unsafe space. That depends on physical exertion and exhaustion. Okay, so those three things might help you with your um, final... It's always the case that the students that are doing fine, their parents come in and we can tell them they're doing fine. Um, but those students that are struggling, it's increasingly difficult to see parents about the problems. I think this, this to me is the, the, the biggest sadness really because what a child wants and needs more than anything else is to feel that they are um, accepted, supported by their family. Modern day parents are um, missing out on what are they getting wrong. Which sort of raises the, the angle that um, you need a license to have a dog, and that's all very regimented and it's actually kind of tricky getting a dog, but anyone can have a baby. I think that incomplete people should be rendered infertile or something, I don't know. But, I don't know, maybe it should, I don't know if it necessarily has to be harder for people to have babies, but, oh, I don't know. That's a hard one, that's really a hard one. How does being a part of others affect how you feel about yourself? And there I think there's very consistent literature suggesting that young people who feel like members of a community, a church, a school, a family, um, do better in the world, can be more generous, can be less defensive, can seek help, can give help. And then I think the other way is if you have a life where the culture tells you you're worth nothing, um, there's no possibility for you, you're not college material, I can't tell you the number of young people I meet who have been told they're not college material, then I think you define an opposition in another way, um, which is that you're not what the culture wants from you and then you're not going to play by the rules of the culture. I'm surprised that kids who are treated badly become scary adults. It's really intimidating sometimes you look around and you don't feel as if you're 
up there with the best of them. You're not wearing you know, the best gear and stuff. You're not looking the prettiest girl or whatever. I think that there's a lot of other um, pressure from other females as well. And um, you don't get into trouble even though you know, it may be fun for a while in the long run, it may not be. I think what makes me feel good about myself is when people affirm you or say, oh, you're really doing really well at this or something like that. The other day, I had lunch with my dad in the city and he dropped me off at home and I was getting ready for work. And I thought, you know, this sort of thought occurred to me, I wonder if my dad actually really kind of likes me. Like, you, you know, like it's one thing to be encouraging of your child and supportive and all the rest, but to sort of put yourself in the position that maybe that wasn't your dad or you weren't his daughter and you were someone else's daughter or, or whatever, if you'd actually have anything in common and, and if you'd get along and if he'd like you at all, <laughs> or what he'd think of you. Anyway, I wrote, I wrote this about that. I said, um, sometimes I can't help but wonder what my daddy thinks of his little girl. Our conversations, my decisions, my attitudes, my moods, the ever pendulating drive of a youth who admittedly at times still thinks that she's just winging it. In end, only to announce that I am all right and I want to thank you for making me feel that I'll always be all right. Hmm. I've done a lot of expert testimony in either all white schools or all boys schools that are going integrated or going co-ed and in the most perverse of those settings, the schools are entirely premised on who they're not. That's a really troubling configuration of a school. They're not girls, they're not gay, they're, you know, they're not sissies, they're not sassies, they're not skirts, they're not faggots, they're not... It's really different to be in a school where people are connected around who they are and could be and what they could be about that's bigger than who they are. Um, I think in that first one, where you're defined in opposition, I think you're on real fragile grounds. I think those people get sick, I think they split. I think that's the making of drug abuse. I think that's, if you're only defined by who you're not, either internally or externally, I think you're on very shaky ground. I think it's very important that we're able to be a giving community and we're able to be able, able to share, um, whether it's our time, whether it's our money, our experiences, our expertise, that we're able to do that um, to help somebody else because there, there's so many people that need that help. And I think it's a shame if, if our only focus is, is on our own personal success. Um, Ed is a pretty good friend and he, he helps me out when I'm like in need. And a couple of nights ago he came to my ice hockey final and I didn't expect anyone to come but I asked him if he was allowed so that really boosted our team and me. Um, he's a really good friend. We mostly play together all the basic of the time or talk. Um, no matter what people think, we're like a heaps of good partners. If like one one of us, if one person is putting one of us down, we'll come and like say, yeah, well, stuff like that, and and they'll, he'll do the same um, for me if I do it to him. So yeah, we're really good friends. Society gives us, uh, we're given by society, by the leaders, by the main ideology, a standard, so-called standard, a, uh, a point, a uh, goal to reach. That means uh, we should be pretty rich and healthy, good looking and all these kind of things. According to the norms, of yeah, course. Yeah, because, uh, and, and if we're not, and in my opinion that's the main norm, I mean being successful, socially uh, respected, etc, uh, etc, et and if you're not, nothing. Uh, 
and hence you, you, you have a bad self-esteem because you know I read somewhere in a psychology book that uh, your, your self-esteem well basically who you think you are or what you think your value is depends on uh, the, the value that you think people have about you, sure. that is, mm -hmm. you see yourself in the eyes of others. Mm -hmm. If you think that other people, you know, respect you, you know, consider you as someone very important and high and stuff, you'll feel good about yourself. Mm -hmm. you know? But if you feel, on the other hand, if you feel, you know, people, you know, regard you as some kind of consider you as a loser, uh, according to uh, today's society's um, main uh, main ideology, then you know gonna fall into depression. That's pretty precarious though because fashion changes and you know so next year or something else will be hot and you'll be out. But still there's one in my opinion there's one uh, one element that remains the same that is to always be num always be the will to be number one to be at the top mm -hmm. you know in sure. fashion. However it's defined exactly. you're saying. Exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. If it's, yeah. This year, is, if, if, if fashion is you know, wearing uh, red jeans or whatever, and next year it's, it's green jeans, then you have to wear green jeans. Sure. You have to be ready to change. We're always uh, trying to be at the top. At the top of the heap. Yeah, in institutions shouldn't be too concerned when the young people that they have raised are now doing what they've been taught to do although it just creates interesting tensions because we wanted young people to think for themselves and to uh, make it in the world themselves and to be committed to things and be deeply concerned about issues of deep value and now they are the problem is they've now chosen things that aren't what their parents chose and that's part of the tension because they really have been trained to think clearly make good commitments uh, give yourself to something uh, the amount of volunteerism in this world is just phenomenal. And we, we have a volunteer program on our campus where we require students to have 60 hours of community service in every year. Well, when we first established it, we thought, oh, they'll never be able to do 60 hours. They do 120 hours before you even ask them to do 60. And the faculty can't believe it because the faculty's not involved in community service to that degree. And that's the difference in the generation. They, they're doing what they've been taught to do, they're doing it better than anyone thought they could, and it's driving the institution crazy. Because what'll happen is change will come whether the institution wants it to happen or not. And you, you've got to just sit back and enjoy the change. That's the only way you'll survive. So your parents build your self-esteem. Oh, Olsen, you're wonderful, well, yeah. you're a lovely boy, you're a lovely boy. What do you mean you only got a B on your test? <laughs> <laughs> you know, both things, right? Um, so they create who you are, right? Is that different to your self-esteem? Absolutely. Is it? Yeah, because I think your parents give you your background and your roots and they, they set you off, if you like, in life and they tell you what, what they think you ought to know. Um, but ultimately, you have to then test that against the world and you have to test that against your experiences. And when, you, when you've had experiences that can, can give you a viewpoint, if you like, then, then you can start... Um, yeah. I don't think it's necessarily different from what your parents give you. I think it's a start, what your parents give you. It's the, like, the putty, I guess, the, 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 and you, and you mould it and you put your own impressions on it as you, as you go along. But without that, without that start, you're on pre, you're pretty shaky ground. If you, if you never got... You know, I mean, the little pats on the back from now again. You know, um, you know, you and, and knowing that in your parents' eyes, you know, you um, that uh, you are loved and etc. etc. And they, and they uh, were proud of you for who you are and, 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 and so on and so forth. Um, you know, if you don't have that foundation, it's harder to build self-esteem. Absolutely, it is. But but you see, that's what I'm saying. You don't. You then can't gain self-esteem until you have tested out your values or until you have achieved things that you set yourself to mm. achieve. Uh -huh. um, I think... And those things that you set out to achieve are governed by um, perceptions of others rather than generated from yourself. If, if you're on a desert island or, or if you have no input from other people, is there a residual self-esteem? You know, that is high or low, depending on who you are, rather than any any other out external input. I think there must be, because it depends yeah, on how is. you would there approach is. that really situation. Good. It's very good you say it, because 
immediately you put it in the, the desert island context, you realise that we're social, we're, so, we're social animals, we're social people. And we're socialised. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So we cannot do without the opinions of others. Right. This orientation and absolute obsession with our, uh, our self-satisfaction. If only I can be happy looking into myself and satisfying myself, I can make somebody else happy. It's quite interesting that that isn't the route that most of the mystics down through the ages have said and much of the social scientific research has, uh, has backed up. What they've said is that you find fulfilment, happiness for yourself when you help somebody else achieve their needs and their wants by looking outside of yourself and serving others. That's how you best serve yourself. I think there's a lot of opportunity. I, I think religion has, uh, particularly Christianity, has a very important message. Uh, the, the core message is how valuable each individual is. and if we could really show that value and show that we share that value of, of those about us, uh, that they're all valuable, uh, it could make a big difference. From my background as a public health physician, almost every problem of public health significance, whether it's HIV or uh, the STDs or injuries, uh, intentional or otherwise, or, or teen pregnancy, or drunk driving, or, or things of that sort. Almost all of those are related to people being willing to take unnecessary and excessive risks. And why do take, people take excessive risks? Because they don't figure they're worth uh, avoiding those risks. If you really think that you're worth something, you avoid unnecessary risk. And that's really the message that, that the church could and should give is you, everyone, people out there, people in the room, all of us are valuable.